Uh, thanks so much, Brenda, and uh, thank you, uh, Mark, as well, um, and, and for hosting this uh, uh, wonderful conference. Um, I just want to, uh, again, acknowledge the work that uh, Mark has led uh, with Wendy Doyle uh, on the development of the framework that he presented on for automated vehicles. Uh, that document, in my pers uh, from my perspective, is going to be uh, absolutely elemental to Canadian jurisdictions moving forward uh, that wish to implement uh, testing regimes for AVs and prepare for uh, for deployment. So it's a very important uh, uh, document, uh, and I think it's a uh, one that's very progressive and forward-looking as well. Um, so my presentation today will be on uh, Ontario's approach to automated vehicle testing, uh, both from a uh, you know the current uh, regime um, and also a future uh, consideration uh, per perspective. Um, it's really a a, a very pivotal time uh, in the. Uh, sphere of automated vehicles and automated, aut automated vehicle uh, technology right now. Um, there's been a number of very recent uh, and important developments uh, in, in the realm. Um, technologies, for example, are developing very quickly. Uh, there are jurisdictions uh, in the United States, uh, California uh, comes to mind, uh, that have uh, 50 uh, testing organizations operating within their jurisdiction. Uh, in Ontario, we have uh, seven to date, uh, but I'll, I'll provide some more detail on that uh, shortly. Um, so the technology is developing very quickly. Uh, there's also been widespread calls for provinces, uh, jurisdictions, uh, uh, the federal government as well, uh, to do more when it comes to automated vehicle uh, uh, you know, preparation for the, uh, the uh, uh, you know, deployment of automated vehicle technology. Uh, a few months ago, the, Senate, the Canadian Senate released a, a very important uh, uh, paper speaking to that as well. Um, we've had a number of high-profile crashes uh, in, in the United States, uh, as referenced uh, during one of the presentations this morning, um, involving Tesla vehicles. Uh, there was an Uber crash that was very that gained a lot of uh, media attention uh, in Arizona um, n not very long ago. Uh, that collision continues to be uh, under investigation. Um, and uh, from the public perspective, you know, there's still a lack of trust uh, that we see. Uh, in, with respect to automated vehicles. Uh, a recent survey that the ministry did um, found that 50% of our population still does not fully trust these vehicles to be safe. So th those are some uh, uh, challenges and uh, environmental uh, factors that we need to consider uh, going forward on the file. All of this really speaks to, uh, though, at the end of the day, the need uh, to develop and, and, and get ahead of the technology with, with regulations and, and legislation uh, if we can. Um, it speaks to the need for the, uh, our regulatory approach to be robust, uh, forward-looking, uh, and flexible, and to balance road safety with, uh, with you know, the desire of industry to test. Um, I, I think we can all agree that uh, you know, there's a need to promote automated vehicles. The safety potential of these vehicles is is uh, incredible, uh, and so we, we want to provide a regime uh, that doesn't compromise safety but allows folks to come in and, and test their vehicles. Uh, so a little bit of context. Uh, Ontario uh, first introduced its automated vehicle uh, pilot uh, for testing on public roads on January 1st of 2016. As I mentioned, we now have seven pilot participants um, testing eight different vehicles in the province. One of those participants is Uber, uh, and Uber has voluntarily suspended uh, their operations um, following the crash in Arizona, and we continue to work very closely with them on, on the next steps uh, with respect to their testing. Um, but we continue to, you know, actively consider how AVs can, you know, will fit into our province and, and, and with respect to our transportation goals, whether it's, you know, uh, uh, public transit, um, you know, the connection to, uh, infra like, you know, vehicle to infrastructure uh, connectivity um, and things like that. Um, the other crucial element here is, uh, is data and data collection, which is something that we're looking at expanding um, and, and gain, you know, reaping more uh, data from pilot participants to learn more about their testing experience, uh, which will help us evaluate our, uh, our program. Um, Mark touched on, uh, on these roles uh, in, in kind of, I think, a more robust uh, way. Um, but uh, I guess the key thing to keep in mind here is that all levels of government have a crucial role with respect to automated vehicles, as really we all do, um, whether it's, you know, the, the uh, industry sector, uh, you know, NGOs and road safety organizations, um, and, and then, of course, government itself. 
Uh, and so, I, I mean, I, hitting on some of the kind of the main things here, uh, the federal government uh, establishes new, uh, safety standards for new uh, and imported vehicles. Uh, there are no safety standards that have been developed to date for automated vehicles. Uh, and frankly, I don't think it's desirable to do that at this point because there are so many different things happening from a technology development perspective uh, uh, in isolation and you don't want to get ahead of that by setting standards and then um, you know, um, handcuffing yourself later, I guess. Uh, and so, but that's something I know that the feds are looking at. Uh, from a prov provincial perspective, one of the really main concerns for us at this time is, uh, is testing and allowing testing and accommodating testing in, in a way that, as I mentioned, uh, uh, is, uh, is safe uh, for, uh, for all road users. Um, municipal perspective, you know, I, I think one of the main values and, and, and benefits of AVs uh, for municipalities is, of course, mobility and how people get around. Um, and, and you can see that there's a, a, a really uh, comprehensive uh, role for municipalities in this as well. Uh, with respect to other jurisdictions, uh, as I mentioned, Ontario was uh, the first jurisdiction in Canada to implement an automated vehicle testing uh, regime for public roads. Uh, Quebec uh, and uh, Manitoba are now joining uh, Ontario on that front as well, uh, and they recently announced new legislation. Uh, but you can see south of the border here, uh, there has been a lot of uh, pickup when it comes to, uh, uh, you know, jurisdictions investing in automated vehicle uh, uh, testing and promotion. Uh, this, in fact, this is, is already out of date. Uh, there are some other uh, jurisdictions here that have recently announced uh, testing plans. Um, the, the really central uh, thing to keep in mind here, and, and it's part of the reason that the work that Mark is leading in CCMTA, uh, the work that the federal government is leading with their report, is that there's such a broad disparity between all of the jurisdictions that you see on the slide uh, in terms of the stringen stringency of their conditions, the type of testing regimes that they're implementing. Uh, so, you know, you can look at a jurisdiction like California, which has uh, relatively rigorous um, uh, and stringent conditions that they place on testers, um, everything from the application process to the data that, co that they collect. Uh, and then there are other jurisdictions like Michigan, which provide a, a, a fairly open regime where uh, testers can come in and, and test with, with much fewer conditions. Um, part of, I think, you know, from a, from a jurisdictional perspective, uh, from a, p a pan or cross jurisdictional perspective, I think there's, uh, there's a lot of values, and, and Mark touched on them, to ensuring that the testing is aligned as much as possible. And I know that that's what, uh, what, what NHTSA's desire is uh, in the uh, United States as well. Uh, with respect to uh, our existing pilot regime, I, I apologize for the busyness of the slide, but this provides a very uh, comprehensive overview of how our testing regime looks in the province of Ontario. Uh, to begin, before I get into the specific conditions there on the right side, on the left side you'll see the various levels of automation that have been established by the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, these are the, the levels that are universally used in, uh, in the industry. Um, and by government uh, in referring to automated vehicles. So currently there are uh, vehicles that are up to level two automation on our roads today. Uh, the, some of the, you know, the Teslas are, are a, a, a good example of that. Uh, and those are vehicles that have uh, limited uh, automated uh, capabilities, which may integrate things like adaptive cruise control with lane centering so they can, the vehicle can operate automatically uh, in limited scenarios. Uh, level three is the next step, um, and it is regulated under our pilot, uh, where you'll see that uh, those technologies that I mentioned are used in a, in a more robust manner, uh, but a human driver is always uh, still uh, necessary in order to take control of the vehicle. Um, uh, and and uh, with respect to level four, I guess, uh, it, you know, th the best way of characterizing a level four vehicle is that no human driver is necessary, uh, but... Um, uh, uh, it operates in, I guess, a limited uh, design domain. So it, it operates in a limited space and a limited range. Uh, level five vehicles is, I guess, the uh, kind of the ultimate, uh, you know, thing that a lot of companies are striving for, which is full automation all the time, uh, anywhere, any place. Uh, we don't expect to see that for, incidentally, a very uh, a, a long uh, amount of time. Um, and then getting to some of the, like a really brief overview of, of the pilot requirements that we impose today in Ontario. Uh, as I mentioned, we regulate level three to five vehicles on our roads, uh, which can be tested under sp specific conditions. Um, 
the uh, it's by application. So uh, if you work in a uh, an, you know original equipment manufacturer, a, a research company, a uh, an academic institution. Um, uh, or a component system manufacturer, you can apply to the ministry to actually test in, in the province. Uh, and once we review your application, which is on the next slide, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, we, uh, we vet it, we, we see that you meet all of our requirements, and then we let you start testing on the road. Um, the vehicle needs to be in a safe and operating uh, condition. You must follow all rules of the road. A signed application must be kept in the uh, in the, the glove box at all times, in case you know, uh, uh, f for law enforcement purposes, uh, there's a 500 million, or sorry, a five million dollar uh, liability uh, requirement. Um, we have some basic collision reporting parameters in place that we're now upgrading, and uh, uh, most crucially, a driver needs to be in the driver's seat at all time, monitoring the control of the vehicle. Uh, again, this is just the uh, uh, application process. We, we get a, uh, they, you know, the applicant submits it to us, we review it, we s sign it and send it back. Very, very straightforward. Uh, one more thing before I get into, like, the, f into the uh, future of AVs in the province and some of the issues that we're tackling is a, uh, just wanted to flag an, uh, a very important investment I think that we're making in automated vehicles in the province of Ontario, and that's this formation of the Autonomous uh, uh, Vehicle Innovation Network, which is an $80 million investment over five years. This, the intent of this is to do a lot of things to promote AV tech development and testing in the province, and you can see a list of them there. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we have a testing zone and uh, regional sites to help the technology flourish and develop. Um, if you're looking for more information on this, go to avinhub.ca. Uh, avinhub.ca uh, has all kinds of information on uh, what they're doing uh, in the province. So over the last, uh, I guess, few, um, few months, we've been engaged in very comprehensive stakeholder consultations on automated vehicles. We've talk to all aspects of industry, uh, you know, the OEMs, the technology companies, the pilot participants, the insurance industry, uh, law enforcement, uh, road safety uh, actors in the province of Ontario, uh, to better understand what's happening on automated vehicles and what we need to do and what we need to look at in the future. Uh, and you can see a few things here uh, that are some, some major trends that are emerging right now that we need to account for. Uh, one of them is that SAE Level 3 uh, technology will be commercially available probably by 2020. Um, there were some automakers that were suggesting that it could be, uh, you know, these vehicles could be implemented earlier in North America or could be deployed earlier in North America. Um, but it looks like the current date is 2020. Uh, again, those are vehicles that require a driver in the driver's seat uh, at all time, but have, uh, have some uh, AV capability. Uh, also, driverless shuttles are being tested in a number of uh, jurisdictions. Uh, a good example is there's a, the, the Navia shuttle is one that's very uh, well known. These are level four vehicles typically. Uh, they offer a potentially uh, a very beneficial transit solution for, for municipalities. So municipalities are very interested in testing uh, these driverless shuttles. Um, and then finally, cooperative truck platooning, which is essentially where there are two large trucks traveling, two or more large trucks traveling in very, very close succession, almost bumper to bumper, um, communicating vehicle to vehicle um, uh, in, in order to travel in an automated way um, to reap, uh, I guess, fuel efficiency benefits pr uh, predominantly uh, is another thing that we're, we're, uh, we're hearing about. And so there's existing regulatory barriers that prevent the things that you see on this slide from happening that we need to address. Uh, and this is, um, I guess this is my last uh, slide. Uh, and so just to give you an idea of a, some of the things that we're, uh, we're looking at now, um, as many folks know in the room, uh, Ontario just elected a new government a week ago. And so we're, we're going to be uh, in a situation where we need to um, do some transition, uh, transitioning to that government to see what their priorities are and to learn about the mandate and what their perspective is on automated vehicles. Uh, but these are some considerations and con some considered uh, enhancements to our program uh, that we'll need to take into account uh, in the very near future. And the first one there that you see is uh, permitting SAE3 vehicles in some capacity to be used on uh, public roads. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, a lot of auto ma uh, manufacturers su suggest that these vehicles will be available very soon. Um, and so we're looking at ways that we can accommodate their use on the roads. Uh, 
Um, you know, again, th these are partially automated vehicles where a human is necessary. Uh, uh, the way I think we would look at it is that all, all existing rules of the road would apply and th there would be a very stringent onus on the driver to maintain their uh, attention. I think, you know, the human factor element is very key uh, in this and ensuring that these, uh, these drivers that are behind the wheel of these vehicles um, know their responsibilities and don't engage in things like distracted driving and, and you know, fatigue driving uh, uh, impaired. They need to know what their responsibilities are. And a lot of the crashes that have happened to date with respect to level two vehicles, uh, there's clearly a disconnect between, you know, the driver uh, and, and uh, the driver knowing what the responsibility actually is. Uh, the second uh, point you'll see here is permitting driverless testing. Uh, so this would, again, like the, the driverless shuttle I mentioned on the slide prior, um, would be to allow testing with no, with no driver whatsoever in the vehicle on, on public roadways. Uh, seems like a, a potentially daunting task, but there are some, some jurisdictions that are already looking at this. Um, there are a number of parameters that I think we would put in place that align with the CCMTA uh, and Transport Canada guidelines. Um, and uh, one of the things I think we would look at is, you know, ensuring that these, these uh, organizations have done uh, uh, a sufficient amount of closed course testing, that they're declaring the safety and efficacy of their products, um, and that they, they're clearly stipulating what the design domain of their vehicles is, and that, you know, it is operated in those design domains. Um, one of the other considerations is the in implementation or uh, uh, essentially requiring pilot participants to provide us with a law enforcement uh, interaction plan. As you can imagine, there are serious challenges if a driverless vehicle is being operated on a public road, uh, there's nobody in it. Um, how is law enforcement, how are ambulances, how are uh, uh, fire trucks and other emergency vehicles going to be able to respond to those vehicles. So that's a, a very key consideration and we want, the, uh, we want to be very satisfied with the plans that are put in place uh, and the technology that's put in place by these, by these uh, testing organizations. Uh, of course, there will need to be some kind of sustained oversight function, whether it's remote oversight or a passenger on board that can hit a, uh, a kill switch to turn the vehicle off um, uh, in an emergency situation. Uh, we're looking at signage requirements, liability requirements, uh, and also a requirement to alert local authorities of testing and working with municipalities on, on testing um, um, as to what roads are, are viable. Uh, not going to get into the platooning uh, aspect of it too much, but again, it's something that we're looking at. I think the, uh, the requirements, uh, there are no universal guidelines that have been established for platooning to date, but uh, uh, I think we would operate a very stringent regime, per perhaps more stringent than the AV testing regime. Um, uh, in terms of the, uh, uh, the stringency of the conditions uh, for the simple reason that we're dealing with large trucks here. Uh, that are traveling in very close proximity to one another in an automated way. That obvi obviously poses some substantial uh, safety uh, challenges and considerations that need to be taken into account. Uh, many to do with, for example, uh, you know, the vehicle equipment itself, the maintenance requirements, the kinds of brakes that are used, how close these vehicles are traveling to one another, um, driver training. All of these things are things we're considering and looking at uh, when it comes to permitting uh, truck platooning. Uh, and finally, I'm happy to note that uh, this is no longer really a consideration. We just actually did make some tweaks to the data reporting requirement under our existing automated vehicle pilot regime. Uh, initially, uh, in that 2016 pilot that we implemented, uh, our the data we were collecting was very scant. It was limited um, to mostly collisions and the circumstances that were surrounding collisions. So now we are uh, moving forward with annual and semi-annual reporting for uh, testing, uh, you know, uh, participants. And uh, we'll be looking at things like the, you know, the hours they, they've traveled, where they've traveled, the kinds of road, the, you know, the kinds of weather, what kinds of uh, disengagements have occurred with the technology, whether the disengagements were intentional or not, uh, and so forth. And so um, that's, uh, that's what we're looking at. Uh, I, I, that concludes the presentation. Happy to address any, uh, any questions.